This weekend in our tradition, we celebrate the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd is always the one who really looks out for the needs of all those around. And moderating that session will be uh, Mr. Lester Firstberger, recognized nationally as a regulatory attorney and expert in consumer finance, securitization, mortgage, and banking law. In a variety of capacities over the past 30 years, uh, Attorney Furstenberger has represented the interests of numerous financial institutions in securitization and other transactions valued in excess of $1 trillion. And disclosure, an account beneficially owned by Mr. Furstenberger is currently a partner in the Mvona Fund LP. He'll be moderating questions directed to the f- two of our uh, panelists, and the first is uh, Father Emmanuel Lemelson, the CIO of Lemelson Capital. Reverend Father Emmanuel Lemelson is a Greek Orthodox priest, activist, and investment manager known for advocating a philosophy of investment based upon Christian ethics. His investment research and analysis has been cited in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, USA Today, New York Post, Fox Business Network, and TheStreet.com, and credited with influencing share prices in publicly traded companies, while his ongoing battle with U.S. regulators over ligand pharmaceuticals continues to make headlines. And finally, uh, John Zarian, the CFO of Lemelson Capital. He is a seasoned hedge fund professional with 35 years of experience in the alternative investment industry. Uh, John has held leadership positions in two hedge funds, with the first growing to $650 million in assets before the retirement of the general partner, and the second growing to several billion dollars in assets. Disclosure as well, an individual retirement account beneficially owned by Mr. Zorian is currently a shareholder in the Mvona Fund Limited. How did you get into this? Give people the background of how you got into investing and and creation of a fund. You know, that's a great question, Lester. Uh, You know, before I was ordained, I mean, I graduated from the seminary in 2003, and uh, I wasn't immediately ordained, and I decided instead to work for about eight years and I was uh, building companies. And, uh, but around the time of 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, uh, I really felt drawn to go back and look at the public markets for securities. And interest, something I had initially in for a very long time, uh, really since I was a young man living in the Seattle area. And I took a great interest in that. I took a great interest in, uh, in particular, mortgage securitization, which was a hot topic only a few years later in 2010, 2011. I began to publish articles in, in that space and Eventually, uh, the bishop called me and said, uh, you know, you're getting kind of old. Are you going to get ordained or what? I mean, <laughs> I, I couldn't say no. I said, but look, I've been involved in this work in security analysis. I'll stop doing it. He said, well, wait a second here. Uh, you know, is the church paying you? I said, no. You know, I'm always sort of going to these churches where I love to be. Uh, pay wasn't a driving consideration. He said, well, you know, you have a family. Keep doing your work. And that was a tremendous blessing. And, uh, in fact, that man uh, just today was named the Archbishop of America. Uh, And his wisdom and and foresight and discernment was greatly appreciated. But I thought to myself, what will people think? Uh, We think of the clergy or we think of the church uh, in terms that uh, not really of the world, right? You hear this a lot. In the world, but not of the world. Catholics are very fond of saying this, especially. But the reality is, is that... uh, to use more crude terms, money makes the world go round. Uh, you really can't do anything without it. I mean, you couldn't build churches or have any sort of ministry or hospitals or anything like that without it. So well, what does the gospel say about all this? I mean, allocation of capital. I was really drawn to the work of Ben Graham. And, uh, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, the work of uh, Warren Buffett. I said, well, where are the Christian commentators? And why are we not taking advantage of this? Would it make us more pious if we ignored it? And I don't think it would. So I said, well, I don't know what the world's going to think of this, but you know, let's start talking about these things openly and frankly. Let's not uh, let's try to avoid a, a pseudo piety. And um, I think the need to be good stewards over capital is very Christian. The gospel is replete with examples of that. Being intelligent with capital allocation certainly very Christian. Uh, was the world ready for that message? I'm not convinced. <laughs> uh, and I think those. Apprehensions were well-founded because there was some pushback. Vis-a-vis the piety of yeah, making money. What's this money? priest doing on Wall Street? I mean, he yeah, shouldn't yeah. be talking about shorting companies and so forth. Yeah. And, and people thought that was really aggressive. 
And I was saying, look, uh, not only is that not aggressive, I think we have a moral and ethical responsibility to be shrewd in our capital allocation, even if that meant uh, declaiming against fraud, even if that meant uh, if we find something that's not right, we're willing to even short it. Uh, and that brought me into a realm of, of activists and operators on Wall Street who were unpopular to begin with. So uh, I didn't fully appreciate, I don't think, the, the blowback that would create. But, yep. uh, uh, you know, there's a wonderful saying. I, I began to realize eventually that uh, somebody once said to me, you know, look, if, uh, if you speak well of me, do so often. Uh, yeah. If you speak ill of me, do so sparingly, but just speak of me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if it got people's attention, glory be to God, uh, it created a pulpit. It, it created a, a platform upon which to uh, convey that message of the gospel. So you mentioned Ben Graham and Buffett. Sure. So, and, and, you know, obviously that's about value investing, which is a central thesis. Huh. Talk a bit about that, about uh, your investment philosophy thesis. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into the longs and the shorts and, and how that plays out. Sure. Um, so uh, the work of Ben Graham is, it's not new. And um, the principles of wise investment policy are actually timeless. I mean, uh, markets have existed for a very long time. The current machinations that we see on Wall Street are just the latest um, manifestation of uh, open and free markets. But uh, whether someone is wise or they're foolish in how they approach that, I mean, human beings don't really change over time. Uh, so what Ben Graham did is he took sort of the, these timeless principles of wise investment policy and he brought them into the current era. He has a perspective, great philosophical mind, uh, but he avoided any particular dogma. I mean, his faith background, he was Jewish. Uh, and then, of course, his most famous student, Warren Buffett, uh, is in, you know, a persistent agnostic. Mm -hmm. This guy's got great power. He's got great wealth. He's got a tremendous following. But I think he views <clears throat> belief and any system of belief as being an ideologue. So he'll go to great lengths to avoid that. I think that's a tremendous error. Um, but if we as Christians are, of course, not learning from that, we're making a mistake. So I looked at the Intelligent Investor and Security Analysis, the two seminal works of Ben Graham, said we're going to use this uh, to the fullest extent possible. And I very quickly, I mean, really probably minutes, came to the conclusion that the only way to be consistently successful over a long period of time was to have a value orientation. And that meaning that if you can purchase productive assets at a price that's demonstrably below its intrinsic value, you're going to achieve two things. You're going to protect the principle, and you're probably also going to get better than average rates of return over the long run. And why would that be important? Uh, and frankly, it's in order to compound. So... <clears throat> If you look at the track records of this small group of quote-unquote value investors, uh, it's tremendous. It really can't be coincidence, right? I, I think most participants in the market uh, would say that, you know, maybe managers can be successful for a short period of time, but over a long period of time, they're, they're going to strike out. But that, the numbers really don't bear that out amongst the value investing community. So that's my opinion. If, you, if you're really interested in compounding capital over a long period of time, I'm not sure any other system uh, would be uh, consistently successful. I said, well, look, you know, you, in terms of the gospel, you know, in terms of stewardship, accountability, well, all of that is manifest in that approach. So that paradigm, which I didn't invent, I mean, every value investor executes a little bit different, right? Because everyone's mm -hmm. personality type is a little bit different. But that needed to be brought into the present. I mean, as faithful Christians, if we believe uh, what we say we do, uh, there's nothing that uh, that would contradict in the gospel. So I thought we need to bring this into our own system of belief and our own approach and our own praxis in the church. So contrasting value investing to investing in you know, uh, Amazon, Google, you know, these are high flyers, high multiples. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, one, of the, uh, one of the things that you're very good at that, that many investors uh, look at is your analysis. And your analysis on value investing when you apply that to Amazon, for example, it's uh, just you know go take people through that analysis because it is very different outcome uh, from a, from a analyzing an Amazon versus a geospace. Or sure, sure. So Ben Graham, throughout most of his early career, uh, really focused on what he called cigar butts. So these were companies that didn't necessarily have a great long future ahead of them. There was a mispricing or pricing error. He saw that tangible assets usually, or discounted current assets, uh, if you, they were discounted enough, there was enough of a pricing mistake, they could be bought and sold at some point, six months or a year down the road, for a better than average rate of return. Uh, 
towards the end of his life, he had begun to change that. He had begun to develop the idea of investing in the great company that would produce uh, you know, measurable free cash flow uh, for the foreseeable future, call it 10 years, uh, a substantial rate of return given a certain discount rate, the risk-free rate of return. Mm -hmm. Buffett doesn't talk about this. He, he'll attribute this to Munger. But he clearly changed his philosophy to be that as well. I'm not sure why, because clearly Graham had arrived at that before Munger. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Munger, of course, is the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, he did make a clear shift to the, if you can buy a great company at a fair price and own it long enough as a productive asset, you would do extraordinarily well, even better than just buying the proverbial cigar butts. Um, and that's what you saw then in Berkshire, the shift to we're going to buy American Express and own it indefinitely. We're going to own Coca-Cola indefinitely. And, we're, and you know, Geico will eventually buy the whole company. Um, there is a lot to be said for that. Uh, there's a great saying that as activity goes up, returns go down. Uh, so, you know, nobody on the Forbes 400 is a day trader. <laughs> yeah. and, and they also don't have great diversity. Usually they own just a few, sometimes just one uh, asset. But it's a productive asset and they own it for a long time. So there's a lot of wisdom in that. But I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think if you can buy a great company at a discount, then you're getting the best of both worlds, uh, especially for the dividend payer. So. Some, you know, you're talking about a multi-trillion dollar industry, the securities mm -hmm. industry, and we as human beings, we take something simple and we make it complicated sometimes, maybe because a lot of people have to justify their work uh, and their pay. Uh, certainly not everyone working in the financial industry has talent. Yep. Talent is fairly rare. I think we do have to look at the quality of leadership, if there's visionary leadership, uh, but you know, a lot of people will try to ride the coattails of a Berkshire, and unless you're managing tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, that's not the best strategy. Um, yeah, I think you, know, you can do extraordinarily well with a whole spectrum of companies out there that the Berkshires of the world will never be buying and probably get even better returns. So. Uh, switching a bit to the fund now, uh, Geos is a principal investment. You have a, a significant level of concentration in that. Sure. Just talk to, uh, talk to the reason for Geos, the thesis. I, many here will probably know what it is, but some may not. Well, because we like pain. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a company we began buying some years ago, and it really was something we looked and said, well, look, this is uh, a company that produces a real product that has high utility. And a lot of the times when you're allocating capital on a value basis, um, traditional arbitrage opportunities don't really exist because high-speed computing, but mm -hmm. there's always time arbitrage. And there's what I would think of as media arbitrage. So, so long as CNBC or Bloomberg or Reuters or whatever is... Um, promoting a story which may not be totally accurate, uh, a large number of people will follow that. So um, you know, some of the rarest qualities in human nature uh, is the ability to think independently. It, it's just most people are not really wired or comfortable doing that. People feel safe in a group. Uh, not unlike uh, you know, fish, fish school together mm -hmm. to ward off threats. Uh, but in Wall Street, that's not very smart. And uh, when we came across Geos, we said, well, here's a company with you know, extensive assets that were being held, we felt, on the balance sheet at, at a value that was uh, significantly depleted below its real intrinsic value, real estate namely, uh, no debt, and a really long operating history. So the arbitrage opportunity with the media there was that the media, if, if you were reading the media two or three years ago, you would think that there was so much oil in the world being produced that people have to you know, fill their swimming pools up with it, and that everyone would have a Tesla and a windmill in their backyard next year. And that just wasn't accurate. I mean, that wasn't really being borne out by the figures coming out of China in terms of oil demand and the depletion rates on conventional reservoirs. So we looked and I said, well, look, there's really no technology to displace seismic. These guys are the leader, 30-year history. You know, they were producing like $5 a share in EPS in 2013. Stock was trading $110 a share. We figured the real estate and inventory was probably valued at $25 a share at least, even though the company was reporting numbers much lower than that. And uh, we said, well, the pendulum's going to have to swing back. I mean, there, you, a trillion dollars came out of EMP exploration production at that time. And we said, if conventional reservoirs are depleting 12% annually, and the oil major is taking a trillion dollars out of EMP, there's going to be a deficit at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it was almost like a sure thing. You know, people were going to need seismic to poke holes in the ground to get more hydrocarbons. So we bought into that. Now, it, it's been, uh, well, I say we like pain because it was a small cap and there were other challenges, uh, but we stood by our commitment and we've seen several years of consistent growth in the company and we think that will continue. 
I think we're right. I think we're being proven right. And I think that uh, whatever happens to the market, I don't think will be correlated uh, to it. It's an interesting time to be an investor now because we are really in the longest bull market in history by some accounts. And there's probably an entire generation of people operating on Wall Street who think this is normal. You just buy it, whatever it is, it goes up tomorrow. Yeah. It looks a lot like the housing uh, bubble of 2007, mm -hmm. 2008, in my opinion. But that's not reality. The reality is markets move in cycles. This cycle will end. Uh, it's been driven by uh, the same factors as previous market cycles. That is uh, low cost capital, artificially low interest rates, quantitative easing. Uh, so we, I'd like to think we're not caught up in that uh, group think, if you will. It's driving markets to new highs every day. Uh, we're buying things that we understand, or we think we have a reasonable insight into the future, uh, and that we think is protected by significant tangible assets. Um, can you speak to how you, you touched on it briefly? Macroeconomic uh, uh, issues factor into your analysis. Uh, you know, what the Treasury rates are doing, a, a slight inverted yield curve for a short time, uh, things of that nature, you know, what ECB is doing, <laughs> things of that. Well, I, I, we have to be cognizant of macroeconomic issues, but it, it, that's in terms of understanding generally what is the, what's really driving the prices. So we've had this stimulus. First, we had quantitative easing, then we had the tax relief provided by the Trump administration. And uh, you can look at that. I mean, you can easily pull up. What does that do for borrowing rates? And what are people doing in terms of their leverage in markets? What, what's mm -hmm. the size of margin loans? Is that what's driving uh, the market? Uh, and of course, the irony is that margin loans are probably the riskiest type of loan you could take, right? I mean, it's an instant call feature, virtually instant liquidity. Uh, but, but the irony is that for the lenders, it's one of the safest loans they can make, right? I mean, for the borrower, it's one of the riskiest. So if you look at that, that's really reaching new highs. I don't think that's a coincidence that that's going hand in hand with reaching new records in the major indexes. But we're not buying indexes. We're not buying the market. A lot of people will say, well, are you following the market? Well, of course, I'm interested in macroeconomic issues, but we are owning pieces of companies. We like to think of ourselves as owners. Mm -hmm. And we've been engaging with managements and boards of directors as owners. The, the word you know, passive investor, in my mind, is a, it's a bit of a con contradiction. I mean, nobody should ever be passive. Whether you own one share or your, your money's at Fidelity or wherever it's at, you need to know who's managing it. You need to own, know what you own and why you own it. We know that per, to a pretty uh, high degree. Whatever the future may bring, uh, whether the market declines tomorrow or next month or next year, you really should be able to sleep at night uh, if, if you know what you own because um, if, if you can hold it for a long enough period of time and you have a reasonable insight into the economic value of the company and its future for cash flows, uh, you're going to be fine, I mean, no matter what happens at large. So one more question for you and then I'll ask John a couple. Uh, uh, so we've been talking long uh, exclusively. Talk about shorts. How, yeah. how that works in the value in the value <laughs> analysis. Well, uh, you know, short sellers are unpopular historically. They're looked at as un-American, uncapitalist. I don't know what they're looked at. I think that's unfair. Uh, if somebody's long an issue, they believe that the guy selling them the stock is making a mistake, right? That's mm -hmm. why they're buying it. So he thinks he's smarter than the guy on the other side of the table. And you might have noticed Wall Street is. Humility is not the chief virtue on Wall Street. <laughs> I mean, everyone thinks they're smarter than the next guy on Wall Street. Uh, and what's his motivation? It's profit. Well, the short seller is precisely the same thing. He's, on the, he's just on the other side saying, well, I'm selling it to the buyer because I think the buyer's a chump. Yep. And my, his motivation is profit. Now, you can get even more interesting than that, like who's right and who's wrong. You can get into, well, what's the ethics here? So short sellers get a bad rap. But frankly, they're doing the best research out there. Uh, why? They have limitless risk. So if you go long a stock, you can only lose 100%. But because a stock can appreciate more than 100%, the short seller technically is taking limitless risk, so his research has to be right. So in a bull market, in a bubble market, where the reins are relaxed a little bit, right? I mean, you're going to see all sorts of fraud evolve in a 10-year bull market. And, and to quote Buffett, you know, you know who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. <laughs> yeah, so th these frauds will be exposed more when the market, you know, returns to something more normal in valuation. But um, my position became eventually, look, if you know what you're looking at and you come across accounting or business or securities fraud, one, reveal it. And two, 
I think it's ethical, ethical to short it, especially if you have a fiduciary responsibility to your investors. But you've got to be right. And not only because of the additional risk you're taking on behalf of your investors, uh, but because it would be, I think, wrong if you made a false accusation against the company. Mm -hmm. So there are probably people who abuse that genre of investing. But in my mind, most of the people who are active as short sellers are doing some of the best work uh, on securities analysis on Wall Street. And very often, they're doing the work that the regulators, for one reason or another, won't do. So, Great. Uh, John, so... You know, when I, and you've been on Wall Street a long time also, so when I look at it, it's, when people ask me, you know, what, what's Wall Street like? I said, it's like the NFL. It's a meritocracy. Either you're good and you play well and you get to stay, and the minute that you're not good, you're off doing something else because it's, it's that requirement is that you be the best. So um, you've been involved with the fund now for a while, so j just give us your perspective as a CFO on how how the fund operates from a, uh, a difference in, in more traditional funds, shall we say? Well, first of all, um, you're right that, that, that Wall Street's probably, um, I won't say it's the last uh, bastion of capitalism that we have in our economy, but it is certainly um, one of the most foremost uh, bastions of capitalism. And, and even though <clears throat> I think... Uh, Politically, a lot of people like to, uh, or politicians like to criticize um, Wall Street for uh, excessive greed and, and you know, misconduct and, and all that stuff. And, and in some cases, it's true. It's all there, sure. Uh, it's, no, there's no question. Um, I think sometimes people fail to realize just the amount of wealth created uh, in our country over the last hundred years because of the systems that have been in place. And Created, managed, and protected. And protected, yep. correct. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's the, look, I'm, I'm, I feel blessed to have met Father Emmanuel a few years ago. Um, I, I worked closely with, with two large hedge funds for over 27 years. And the people who ran, uh, the, the managers of the funds, the founders of those funds, they were good people. They're, you know, it was, you know, they were not, they never did anything wrong. They never ran afoul of any regulators or anything like that. But uh, I'll be honest, they're, while they, they certainly wanted to um, make good returns for their investors, the reason they wanted to make good returns for their investors was because that would result in great, great returns for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anything, anything wrong with that. That's, that's capitalism. That's entrepreneurship. That's OK. But I think what, what has set uh, Envona apart and, and Father Emmanuel is that he truly, truly puts his investors ahead of his own interest um, to a remarkable degree. Um, I think if uh, you gave him a choice and you said, well, in the one hand here, you know, You'll make you know a fifty percent return for yourself, and your investors will make a a fifty percent return. Um, would you accept that? Or on the other hand, you know, in this case, your investors will make a hundred percent return. You won't make any money. I think he'd accept the latter. I mean, I honestly believe that, and uh, I think that in itself is what sets sets him apart from the quote unquote average uh, hedge fund manager. Mm -hmm. Look, volatility is not for everyone, mm -hmm. clearly. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things that, that, that go with that. First of all, there are a lot of people, I'm sure most of the people in this room are or have been successful in, in creating wealth for themselves or making a living or how you, however you want to phrase it. But very few people who are good at, at you know, earning a living or, or creating wealth are also good uh, stewards of that wealth over time. Because let's face it, you really can't be good at everything. Most people can't be good at everything. You may be a great you know, engineer, you may be a great attorney or a great you know, physician, but that doesn't mean necessarily you're gonna be great at, at managing your own money. Um, that's why it's important to have someone who, who is, is gonna do that you know, on your behalf. And look, if you have a long-term perspective, 
and, and I and look, everyone, everyone talks a good game. Everyone says, yeah, I'm a long-term investor, right? Mm -hmm. And the first down month that someone has, everyone gets all nervous, right? You say, oh my gosh, fund was down last month. What are we going to do? And I think it's important to keep things in perspective. And as long as you own uh, companies that are, are, are operating the way they're supposed to be operating, the way you expect they're going to be operating, you have to accept the fact that, that stock markets are sometimes irrational. And sometimes markets don't value companies the way they should be valued. That could end, that could end up in, in, in volatile, you know, up and down sort of times. You can't, and, 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 and I've seen over 40 years that, uh, for, as recently as this past December, I have, <clears throat> I have about uh, 75 hedge fund clients in, in my business, and I have about uh, 36, 37 of them that I personally work with. Well, December was a really tough month for virtually every hedge fund in existence. It was just a, you know, there was tax loss selling, there was, uh, there was pro, you know, uh, war, there were, the trade problems with China had, had cropped up. You know, there was, everything was sort of uh, happening against the stock market. So as a result, I had, I had funds that were down 15, 20, 25 percent in the month of December. So what happened? Some of the managers decided, well, this is a time now where I have to sort of crawl into my, my, my fetal position and, and not take any more risk, right? That, and that's inevitably what happens when people who um, don't have as much, you know, uh, who haven't done as much work or don't have as much knowledge about their investments. So what's the, the knee-jerk reaction is to sort of cut back, just to just sort of retreat from taking risk. It's, it's generally speaking, not every time, but generally speaking, it's the direct opposite that you should be doing. You want to be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when, when others are greedy. And I think when, when you see some volatility in a fund, as long as you have confidence in the manager of the fund, that's the time that you want to get greedy. That's the time when you say, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, this person's made, made me great returns over a long period of time. If you're a knowledgeable investor, hopefully you can put that volatility to, to your benefit. And I think that's, that's the challenge for everyone. Are any of your other clients a uh, uh, value, uh, value investor thesis for their fund? Ah, you know, there are a couple, um, but when, when, you're, when you're in the midst of a 10-year bull market, yeah. that, that generally gets the folks who are value investors to all of a sudden become momentum investors. <laughs> um, and, and that's, you know, I think that's, part of the sort of culture of the hedge fund business. Um, it's very, unless you, you have a hundred, 200, 300 million dollar fund and you can afford to sort of not make great returns for a number of years because the market is uh, not accommodating your style of investing, it's real hard not to have what we call strategy creep where yep. all of a sudden you're a value investor but now you're sort of stretching the definition of what a value investment is in order to accommodate trying to you know, put some money to work. So, Emmanuel, to that point, is, is value investing carved in stone or is there, is there flexibility there? Yeah, that's a great question, Lester. So, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot, value investor, because mm -hmm. I think everyone wants to be associated with this aura of Berkshire Hathaway. But the way I see it, in my experience, and to quote the great prophet Lady Gaga, you gotta be born that way. <laughs> I don't care how many acronyms you have after your name. And you see it all the time, right? These guys come out of Harvard Business School or Columbia, and they're gonna go to Goldman Sachs, they're gonna make a killing, mm -hmm. and they raise 500 million for their first fund, and it blows up. Uh, it really doesn't matter, I mean, where you went to school. Either the idea of buying a dollar bill for 50 cents is exceedingly interesting to you, or it's not, and honestly, you can't learn it. Mm -hmm. It either gets you immediately or you never learn it. And in my experience, I mean, you can talk to people to your blue in the face about the wisdom of that. Uh, and unless their brain's wired that way, you can show them all the charts and graphs and numbers in the world, and they're not going to get it. Um, so I think it, with this desire to, to join the sort of cult following behind Buffett, uh, people will say that. I'm running a value fund, and I'm a value investor, blah, blah, blah. But John's 100% right. That's not really supported by what they're doing. And even some very big names on Wall Street will tell you that they're value investors. But when you look at what they're actually doing, it doesn't look like value investing at all to me. Uh, the real value investor, I mean, I always say that 
To be truly great at something, exceedingly great, if one part of the mind is going to excel at something, some other part of the mind is usually inhibited. Now you can see that in uh, really a any field, any profession. I mean, if you look at the greatest musicians, there's some other part of their life that's suffering. And it's, it's certainly true of people who excel in this area of allocating capital. I mean, they, they almost don't feel anything, right? So that's not really human, though. I mean, humans should feel things. They should have emotions. But truly great capital allocators don't. Mm -hmm. They don't care what the crowd's doing. Uh, they don't care what the market is doing. They're not excited by the adulation around IPOs or something like that. Uh, if your brain is wired that way, I mean, you're just at a tremendous advantage to be able to be apart from the group, to think independently. Um, and I've always believed that true value investors, uh, they're exceedingly rare. I mean, statistically, they're an absolute minority. So if you took a poll, probably like 25% of market participants or something like that would tell you they're value investors. But in reality, it's probably like a quarter of a percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very consistent. I don't think they change. And that's not an effort. It's effortless. I think most of the time they're looking around, and it may sound negative, but they're looking around, they're really seeing foolishness most of the time, especially in a market like this one. Uh, they get excited when things you know, start to go south. When everyone else is saying, hey, run for cover, jump in the foxhole, uh, they're, they're getting excited. So that, that, you know, is that uh, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not probably the most normal you know, human psychology, <laughs> but it's a great advantage in public markets, I think. Yeah. Uh, for both of you guys, um, leverage. Uh, advantages, disadvantages, use, how it benefits the fund. Um, look, I, I think the prudent use of leverage is one of the great advantages of, of hedge fund investing. Mm -hmm. uh, most, uh, there are a lot of people nowadays who have brokerage accounts and who, who try and invest their own money, but, but few, if any, can, can handle the added um, responsibility and potential risks uh, involved in, in using leverage. But if you, uh, if you use it uh, prudently, it, it, it can a absolutely uh, increase um, investment returns uh, to a great degree. And I, I agree with John. I mean, um, I think that generally debt is the source of a lot of pain and suffering. You know, there's nothing nice about financial stress. And uh, that's where banks get a lot of negative blowback, right? I mean, people, especially in the last recession, people hated banks, frankly. But any really evolved economy in the world is an economy that is financially evolved. Mm -hmm. Not that it's always perfect. So you see a lot with fintech right now. There will be mistakes made. Things will go wrong. But what's the alternative? Uh, should we go back in time? I don't think so. So where there are sophisticated lending mechanisms in an economy, whether it's Switzerland or the United States or London, wherever, you're going to see a robust, progressive economy, which raises the quality of life for people. The risks with debt and, and margin lending in particular is that people are using it and they don't really know what they're doing. So if you look at the Great Crash of 1929, for example, if we take a page from history, uh, you would see this inversion, which didn't make any sense. So people were borrowing in the call market um, at 8 or 9%. Uh, and dividends at the time were half a percent or one percent mm -hmm. in the late 20s. But you look at what was happening by 2011, 2012, when we were allocating capital very aggressively. And we were paying under one percent for leverage. And you could, uh, you could find stocks all day long that were paying five percent or more dividends. Not to mention the capital return in the way of buybacks, which we knew there would be a flood coming. That's not where we're at today after uh, this long bull run. But if you know what you're doing and your cost of capital is lower than your return on capital, and you truly have a value orientation, meaning you're buying issues where you have a fairly good grasp that the intrinsic value, particularly if it involves tangibles, uh, tangible assets, is greater than the price you're paying, uh, some borrowing is okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's, we use Buffett a lot today as an example. I mean, he'll tell, and rightly so, he'll tell you, don't stay away from leverage, stay from market. And that's good because he's really speaking to a retail environment. But one of the very first things he did is went to the bank with his father and took out a loan to buy stocks. Mm -hmm. and. Um, he has tremendous advantages because he has non-recourse debt. So he's taking the float from insurance concerns like Geico and uh, his other insurance uh, businesses, which is very smart. He's getting paid uh, to borrow that capital, essentially, uh, because they have a profitable underwriting business. But the average person does not have access to zero cost or negative cost capital, uh, making it very risky. So interest rates have come up now. We can no longer borrow money under 1%. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we have to be that much better in our discernment of where we're allocating that capital. If you know what you're buying and you intend to own it for a long time and it's not too leveraged, uh, I agree with John. I think it's uh, perfectly legitimate. Margin loan and these, uh, these portfolio margin loans though and so forth, where fund managers are doing four or five X equity or 10 X, uh, you know, that's ridiculous, that's gambling. And, and, and most of the time that's what's going on on Wall Street, frankly. I mean, the other 99% I think are, we say speculators, but that's just a euphemism for gambling. Mm -hmm. Well, that, 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 what you just mentioned, you asked before about the difference between Ambona and, and other hedge funds. Um, most of my clients take advantage of what's called portfolio margin which is uh, borrowing, uh, and that's something that's, that's come about over the last 15 years or so on Wall Street. It used to be that uh, a fund could only borrow at uh, twice its equity. Well, now you, that you can borrow four times your equity, obviously the risk goes up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And Envona has never done that, and I don't think uh, Envona ever will do that. And that's what I was trying to elicit, the, right. <laughs> the leverage there. Um, when I look at the current scenario where we are today, um, I think there's four key points that make uh, capital, uh, make me believe that capital will be treated very well. One, obviously, we've got companies that are profitable and increasing profits. I mean, I, I say that Apple, JP Morgan, these companies are printing money. Second, we've got interest rates that are not as low as they were, but they're still historically low, and everybody knows that the value of a stock is the discount of future value is cash flows. So we've got two phenomenons there that are very positive. The third is we have an employment force that's, you know, effectively anybody who wants a job can get a job. And lastly, and most importantly, there's almost no real rate of inflation. So if I were looking at a scenario that would be rewarding to capital, it would have those four characteristics. In addition, there's maybe a fifth one, that's there today that isn't always there, but the overall level of pessimism is still extremely high. So how does that relate to the, the housing market and the comment that you made there? And then the second part of that is about margin rates. What's your metric there? Is it uh, absolute value or is it a percentage of market value? So I assume that question's for me. Yeah. Okay. God, I um, hope so. Good, so you're right, Michael. Generally speaking, you look at things and say, glory be to God. Uh, unemployment's at essentially historically low rates. We have a capitalist and business-minded uh, president that could only do good for our economy. Whatever other complaints people may have, it's hard to argue that point. Um, I don't know if I see so much pessimism, however. Um, as a value investor, I'm much more interested in the pessimism I saw in 2010, where people were telling me the Dow was going to go to uh, you know, 1,000. I like that kind of pessimism. Um, also, nobody really knows the future of markets, right? I've never had a prognostication on when markets will turn, whether it would be next month or next year. Uh, but I can tell you, if you're looking for companies uh, where you can get, as I said earlier, sort of this old school Grameenian approach to value where we can buy real estate assets for 50 cents on the dollar and nobody wants it, uh, you could find pages of those things six or seven years ago. You can't, you can hardly ever find them now. So if you're, approach, if your philosophy really is value-oriented, um, you would say, well, okay, this, this economy is doing well. People are generally aware of that. Um, but it was also driven by extraordinary quantitative easing, right? Now, the Fed, the Fed is pulling back off that. Um, but as you pointed out accurately, interest rates are still historically low. So, and then what happened after that? You know, you have all this sort of money sloshing around, and this is driving what? Corporate buybacks in enormous sums. So, in 2011 or 2012, we were buying companies like Apple, by the way, truly great business, printing money, as you say, uh, but before they announced their buybacks. Same thing with Western Digital, we're buying that aggressively before they announced. So buybacks were an exceptional thing then, and, and people at the West Recession were doing the exact wrong thing, right? What was the saying then? Cash is king. Well, that was precisely the wrong thing to do. Uh, you should have been deploying your cash as aggressively as you could while asset prices were low and, and corporations were building up massive war chests, essentially. Um, but the way I see it, I, I, all these things are priced in now, and now also the tax cuts are priced in. So what's the next stimulus? And in studying the history of previous economic uh, recessions and downturns, even if you look at more modern ones, like which happened in the 80s and Black Monday, uh, it doesn't necessarily take an economic event, right? I mean, nobody really knows exactly what caused the change in sentiment in 1929. It can't really be attributed to any one factor. So, but what we do know is that it became sort of self-fulfilling. The more that sentiment and fear grew, 
uh, it actually had real impacts on the economy. So I look at these headlines today and people say, is there going to be a trade war? Is this going to hurt American businesses? And it's political now too, right? I mean, the media has taken sides. So it's okay for some outlets, Bloomberg, for example, clearly has uh, you know, a political bent and they're controlling an enormous swath of financial uh, media and reporting uh, to markets. Uh, if they want to say, if they want to exacerbate or, or use hyperbole about what may or may not happen between China and the US, that can cause real fear. And fear is irrational, just like greed is irrational. So, uh, you, you know, sometimes the most successful form of capital allocation, in my opinion, Michael, is that being able to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. That's hard for a lot of people to do, by the way. Being able to just sit still in a room. Uh, do we have a crisis right now? No, we don't. Could one emerge any moment? Absolutely. And then how does the market feel about prices? In terms of margin lending, it's higher than it was during the dot-com bubble. And I think these things are hard to see when you're in it. During the dot-com bubble, it seemed like the right thing to do to buy anything with a dot-com in it. Many smart and intelligent people, including entrepreneurs, who had built successful business were part of that belief. And it was only in hindsight they could see just how irrational that was. So today I kind of look at some things going on and I see some similarities. I say, well, you've got Jeff Bezos and he's going to land a lunar lander and, and, and Elon Musk is going to start populating Mars. I think we might look back in the not too distant future and say, maybe there was too much capital sloshing around and maybe people were a little too excited about the prospects. So right. there's okay. more challenging for value investing. For value investing I would never try to uh, guess on when that might happen. But I, I will tell you one thing. Uh, the U.S. economy does move in cycles, and there will be a downturn. I don't know when that will occur, but that's when the, uh, the value investors will look smart again. So the margin rate, though, is your metric a percentage of asset values, or is the absolute Yeah, so if you compare that to, you know, to like GDP growth rates, or if you look at the overall growth in the market, and you were to just overlay those things, you could see that margin lending would be a factor so much greater than... Yeah, exponentially greater, yeah. Uh, which is indicative of euphoria, right? I mean, and when you're like, yeah. you're talking to the average guy off the street and he's telling you about his day trading account and his day job is, uh, you know, doing masonry or something, uh, you should probably be a little worried. Yeah, yeah, some anecdotal evidence that maybe you might be in at least a fully priced market, if not more. <laughs> Great question. That's an excellent question, Michael. Thank you. There is this untouchable, or uh, even not palpable, commodity called fame. Okay? And fame can be either media, speculative generated, or fame, gener fame based on real knowledge. How does this fame coefficient impact your decision on investment? Fame like F A N E? Fame, yes. Can you describe more what you're talking about, Doctor? Uh, well, fame is something that people are trying to seek or, or, or okay. generate, okay? You can see on, on the market where there is all this news about IPO, all this news about something that's getting great, okay? Right. And I can see fame either is completely speculative, yeah. okay, usually media-generated, or there's fame really based on real knowledge of information, yeah. okay? Well, on Wall Street, is that coefficient fame does touch you and your uh, decision, or how do you judge fame? Well, company? the way I, I see that, uh, Doctor, is that uh, it's by design most of the time. I mean, people in the media do know investment banks. Investment banks and insiders, particularly in IPOs, which you mentioned, have a vested interest in selling you shares. Mm -hmm. When capitalism works correctly, it's a mechanism to form uh, capital around new endeavors to create great enterprises. But when it's not working correctly, or when it's not healthy, it becomes a wealth transfer operation. So there's a whole lot of engineered fame, to use your word, out there. Mm -hmm. And I think if you buy into what you're reading nowadays, most of it, uh, Google was IPOing. I knew a lot about Google. Uh, we were paying huge bills to Google uh, in, in our business at the time. We were paying like $2 a click or something. It was ridiculous. These guys have no real uh, upfront capital. They have to invest in their business. So the return was enormous. So, that might be a little different if you have like a real insight into the quality of a business and where things are going. But a lot of the times, you know, and you, the average buyer of the IPO doesn't even know they're the buyer of it, right? So you have all these intermediaries between the owner of the capital and the decision being made. And that's why, you know, what we're talking about here today is so incredibly important because a lot of people, you'll ask them, you'll say, well, what was in your paycheck last Friday? And they know. And you'll say, well, 
what did you report on your tax return last year? And they know that. They say, well, what was your annualized rate of return on your investments over the last five years? And just crickets, right? And they just draw a blank. And that's because their money's at some firm where they perceive it to be safe, uh, Fidelity or wherever, I don't mm -hmm. know. I have nothing against Fidelity, but the fact is they don't know who's managing it. And, you know, whether it's CalPERS or whatever it is, some large pension fund, somebody whose interests are not aligned with those people's capital is going to be making a decision and it's going, there's going to be a structure around it. It's like a machine that draws capital into these enterprises. And you can look at the activity in the IPO market and that will also give you a sense, as Michael was bringing up, is this market overheated? The IPO market always heats up uh, during a bubble, frankly. Uh, you know, they don't happen in recessions and that's not a coincidence. So, uh, they say knowledge is popular. These people on the inside, they have a lot of knowledge. And if the issues were so great, uh, you know, why are they selling it to you, <laughs> the insiders? And uh, you know, you can see it too with uh, the reverse uh, Chinese IPOs, which was a huge trend uh, six, seven, eight years ago. And I published articles about this. This idea that we're going to go into a distant land and we're going to find great wealth uh, and riches is as old as uh, time. Uh, but you, know, you have to ask the question, why are these Chinese companies issued du jour? And why are they bringing it to the U.S.? Why not IPO in their own markets? So the further you can get the buyer of the issue from uh, the, the real beneficial owner from the issue, and the more intermediaries you can get in place, you know, the wealth advisor, the, the uh, fund manager, the analyst, and there's you know, like 12 intermediaries, the more you separate the owner of the capital from the allocation, you can do all sorts of things that are not in the interest of the owners of capital. And the media does participate in that. Now for the value investor, who's really unaffected by that, that's opportunity. Uh, you can capitalize off other people's foolishness. Yeah, just in, in keeping with that too, um, uh, I, I think most of us probably know uh, Uber went public on uh, Friday. I think they went public at 45 and uh, it didn't hold that price for very long. I heard something fairly interesting that the uh, private equity markets in this country have become so large over the last five or 10 years that what's happened is that the insiders who invest in these public in these in these companies before they go public, whether it's Uber, whether it's Lyft, uh, whether you know anything like that, the um, uh, that the additional rounds of financing serve to mark the investment up to such an extent that when it goes public, uh, it's just going public rather than uh, becoming a um, a vehicle for individual investors to get involved uh, has now become a vehicle for insiders to get out of these investments. Again, it speaks to Michael to, to perhaps uh, an overheated stock market. Um, I have a client who um, uh, uh, invests privately in Airbnb. And I think the uh, most recent um, uh, round of financing they did was at about $130 billion valuation. So for those folks to make money, obviously, and they don't expect Airbnb to go public until sometime next year, the valuation has to come substantially higher than $130 billion. I don't know about you, but that, that, that seems like a pretty big number to me, right? Especially when you consider that the challenges that they're, they're having or seem to be having with you know, municipalities, whether it's San Francisco, New York, or whatever, um, so again, that speaks to perhaps a, a, an overheated uh, stock market and uh, to what Father Emanuel was saying. And I would say, I would add to that, you know, John, your excellent point, is that that's where you see the rise of private equity as well, right? I mean, in Silicon Valley, you get to put whatever price tag on it you want, or you feel like. They're on us, nine billion, no problem. They ever earn a profit? Uber ever earn a profit? How's Tesla doing? Uh, if you have a small coterie of operators, who know each other very well, they get to assign their own prices. And if that's taking place in a broader economic system where people believe markets are efficient, that's interesting. It warrants looking at it at least, right? And who really prices the Uber IPO? And so, you know, it's the investment banks that have a, a vested financial interest which is not aligned with the buying public. So uh, you, you look at that and you look what's going on in Silicon Valley and um, you think, we're in the wrong business, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really pretty extraordinary. And, and they do it time and time again. And, you know, you'll just open CNBC or something in your browser one day and there's some new IPO coming you feel that you should have heard of, but you've never heard the name and it's X billions of dollars. And I can truly appreciate how Father Emmanuel answered that question instantly because he sees the world differently than most of the, 
the professionals in that in that space. He saw it right away. It was his initial instinct to the fame question that you asked. This is a rigged game. And um, I don't think there are many people in this world who are willing to take a stand against oppression and uh, against a system that's working against people. That zero 100 analogy you made, John, was fantastic. And you, you just don't find people that are willing to take that stance that no, all right, I'm going to take zero for now. Let the shareholders get their 100. But eventually, God balances the equation for us. So thank you for that question. That was wonderful. Thank you for your comments, Todd. Thank you, Father. My name is Anagiros. Um, you mentioned before that um, it's not possible to excel in everything. There must be a weak point somewhere. So I'm going to turn this question to you. As a father of four children, uh, the priest of Wall Street and uh, an excellent fund manager, I also overheard uh, Manolis uh, in his interview saying that uh, he is a great father. What is your weak point? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have many. Uh, no, you know, so, you know, we're all human. And um, we shouldn't belittle or berate ourselves too much. But we, as Christians, you know, we believe fundamentally that we're frail. And um, I think it's Galatians 2.20. says, I've been crucified, and it's no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. If we can't recognize our own frailty, um, it will not be Christ living in us. And um, if that's what we believe as faithful Christians, uh, that's a source of tremendous power. It's not ourselves. And... Um, I hope I've been a good father. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, time will tell. He's an amazing kid, my son. I credit his mother for that. <laughs> um, whether or not I'm considered a good fund manager, I guess it depends on Geospace's future stock price. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I think we'll be going right, though. But, uh, you know, if, uh, if you can't be humble, pretend to be, <laughs> at least, because that, that's a virtue. And uh, I'm not saying I'm humble, but... We have to at least try. And I think when we stand before an all-powerful God and all-knowing God, especially having just gone through Great and Holy Pascha, great, the Easter celebration, if we can't look at a man nailed to a cross uh, who says there's no greater love than this than to give his life for his friends, if that doesn't bring out a modicum of humility in us, I'm pretty sure nothing will. So. Um, a follow-up question upon this. Um, you have been challenging Legend, who, which is a Fraud. tremendous company yeah. and uh, so powerful. So uh, do you believe that, um, uh, aren't you afraid? Like, uh, <laughs> is this like a challenge, like uh, from between David and Goliath? Yeah. It's uh, something that no individual would even think of beginning. Uh, that's a good question, Arius. I'll just speak from my heart. Um, I think the fear chip broke in my brain a long time ago. I'm not sure why. Um, if I have a fear, it's just that my wife and children didn't sign up for my eccentricities. So I pull my punches sometimes. And, um, but to quote uh, my amazing son again, you know, we were sitting at the dinner table one night, Emmanuel, I'm sort of fighting you know, the US government. He said, well, you know, Dad, but you have God on your side, so they can't win. I thought, well, that's good enough for me. I'll go with that. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, there's no, you know, I just go to St. Catherine's and get on my knees and pray. And I want to fight. I mean, I'm really holding back <laughs> right now. Uh, but God works in mysterious ways, and God's justice is perfect. And, uh, you know, the, the government came out and essentially accused me of being a fraud as a whistleblower. And um, uh, I was talking to my bishop that morning. I said, Your Grace, um, the government's going to charge me today. You know, they called and let us know. They had the courtesy to do that. 
And he said, sorry to hear that. <clears throat> I said, your grace, I'm not sorry. This is happening so the glory of God will be revealed. I don't know why I felt that way. I just felt that way exceedingly. And shortly thereafter, uh, Ligon began to crash. So I think the government felt they could control me. I think they probably believed I'd fold. <coughs> They've weaponized fear. They have the deep pockets. It's the U.S. taxpayer. Um, but if God is with you, who can be against you? And we didn't lose a single investor. We've gained investors since that time. Uh, Legan can't say the same thing. Their stock is down over 60%. Uh, they've had six law firms begin investigations for securities fraud. Um, they, almost everything we've written or said over the last four years has come true. Uh, they cannot pay their bondholders. They have 3.9 billion they owe to their bondholders. Uh, they have only about 1.4 billion in cash to pay that. And that's just their current coupons, which are due. Um, that's called insolvency. And I think the market's waking up to it. So uh, glory be to God. In Ephesians, we read that uh, have nothing to do with the fruitless acts of darkness, but reveal them. And uh, if we're going to be sincere, right, if we're going to have integrity, we say, well, don't be afraid, right? And you see this in the gospel ever, Christ is sort of imploring people, be not afraid. And we're not going to be like greed or fear drive us in capital allocation decisions. We must not let fear ever affect our decisions. Only if it's going to hurt innocent people. The only reason I have not been swinging more is because of my wife and children. If I was a celibate priest, you'd be seeing fireworks. I think you're going to see fireworks anyways. <laughs> so stay tuned. Thank you very much. You know, we have a very interesting federal government uh, going on right now between our executive branch and our legislative branch and our judiciary. So there's a, a lot of moving pieces there that touch many aspects of various economies, oil being one. So I just wanted to get a, a thought from both of you guys, what you think on uh, um, you know, what happens in Trump land and the rest of America and the impacts on the Middle East and... Uh, and all of that. When you talk about politics, uh, Lester, it's a dangerous uh, subject. But um, I'll be honest, as a, as a parent and uh, as a grandparent, I really, really, really worry about the direction that, that the government is, is going and what it, it possibly portends for the future of our country. I really be believe that there, uh, the, and again, this is a, you know, a phenomenon that's, that's come about in the last three or four years. Um, uh, th look, I have no idea if any of you folks are, are socialist, capitalist, or agnostic uh, in terms of politics, but I'm telling you, flat out, if you're a socialist, you better do some research. You better do some reading of history, because uh, it, it's, that, that is a, a mechanism that is a, a recipe for disaster. Just look at every country in the world that's followed a socialist path. And, and see what's happened. I mean, it's, and, and everyone, or some, some politicians will tell you, oh, well, you know, you, you know Trump is, or, or if, you're a, if you're a capitalist or whatever, you, you point to Venezuela and say, uh, uh, see, what, see what happens with socialism. And the social, and the, or the quasi socialist in the US will tell you, well, we're going to do it differently. Well, guess what, folks? There ain't nothing different about it, okay? If, 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 if what you're advocating is a, is a system that, that just, uh, takes takes the 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 uh, um, fruits of someone's labor and decides to give it to someone else. Okay, that's a system that's born to fail, and and I really really worry about kids growing up. And there are ton, tons of kids here, and 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 I I'm pretty confident that you, you're going to grow up a little differently. But there are too many young people in our country. That are st and, and again, I'll, I'll blame I'll blame public uh, education for a lot of that. Um, they, they're growing up thinking, you know what? I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to that. Free this. Free that. Well, I hate to tell you, there ain't no no such thing as a free lunch. Someone has to pay for it. But of all the things that in government that I worry about, I, I worry about that. And and I and I hope that that there are enough uh, people in our our country who could sort of see past the, the free lunch or the free breakfast phenomenon and realize that the only thing, the only thing that really uh, guarantees um, um, uh, freedom 
and liberty is the ability to make decisions you know, for your own uh, family, your own self, uh, in terms of your, 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 where do you go to school, where do you go to church, where do you go to synagogue, whatever. Uh, and, and as soon as the government starts to decide that, well, you're going here, you're going here, and you're going here, that's when we're all going down the wrong path, and that's what I worry about. I mean, the, the latest example of that's Venezuela, of course, a very poignant example that we can mm -hmm. see in the news every day. And uh, John, I think, hits the nail on the head. It, it, at the heart of that is really the issue of human freedom. And, you know, if, if you're a person of faith, if you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, I mean, you, you see sort of the theology begins with God endows his creation to be free. And the societies that are more free will be prone to errors and mistakes. Isn't it? Capitalism's not perfect. But when you start taking away human freedoms, uh, the path doesn't look good. I mean, you see these uh, hyper-liberal leftist-center types that, you know, it's 80% of the population in Washington, D.C., for example, where our regulators are located. And um, they don't love Trump, obviously. Um, but it will be a long time, I think, before people have a a fair and objective view of what the Trump administration did achieve or did not achieve, because there's great emotion in our country right now. And emotion clouds everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever you're feeling, anger or fear, agree, whatever you might be feeling, it's going to cloud your view of reality. Um, but history is replete with examples of one socialist system after another that fails. I mean, in my mind, there still is no system, as imperfect as it may be in the United States, that unlocks human potential uh, as well as we do here. We're going to have IPOs that are worthless, but we're also going to create some amazing uh, enterprises that will improve the quality of life for people, uh, whether it's in technology, whatever it may be, manufacturing. So uh, this is a big issue for me in the church circles, right? I mean, if I have to meet another priest that's a closet Marxist, uh, I mean, it would just be too much for me. I mean, so I think we have to be honest, uh, a little bit honest about it and say, well, America may not be perfect, but it's the best I've ever seen by far, and, and we should embrace it. And we should allow it to be transformed if we're Christians uh, in terms of our view of the world uh, this, uh, that we have in our faith. So that's super critical. Great, interesting guy. Unique for a priest, unique on Wall Street. Straightforward, genuine, very analytical. I think he's trying to bring value investing in an affordable way that people can uh, invest in the fund and take advantage of the, uh, the opportunities that he sees. He is someone who brings the book smarts of how you analyze companies, how you analyze stock, with the ethical foundation that he has and the theological foundation that he has uh, from his vocation as an Orthodox priest. How does one take one's capital and grow it, and then what purpose one uses that capital for, which is stewardship and for good works. So he's a unique figure in the American investing world and one that I think that people should be paying much more attention to. I think Father Manuel is a great guy. He's a very passionate uh, investment manager. I like his ethical approach to investment philosophy, his Christian-based investment uh, philosophy. He's very transparent, he communicates, and he generally cares for his investors in the fund. I feel pretty blessed to have met Father Emmanuel. It's hard to find money managers that take such a deep care in the fundamentals, and then the, the management fundamentals as well uniqueness of his ability to find and have the patience to deploy capital, wait through transitions, see transitions coming, and actively work with, with management sometimes to help them succeed uh, is, is a rare quality to find in a money manager. So I really feel it's a, it's a blessing for me to have known him. I find it very interesting how he mixes being a priest and also managing money the way he does and being such a successful investor while also still staying, you know, all the duties that a priest has to fulfill. He's a great dad and I find it amazing how he can do many things at the same time. He gets everything done and he's very focused and he keeps going, he never stops. My dad loves to spend time with me. He honestly puts his investors' goals and ambitions and needs well uh, ahead of his own. Where you and I think that's pretty unique in this business. It's good to get people together, especially from the business world, that really, in a sense, have the means in which they can help everyone to really experience the goodness of life, uh, to have what they need, 
and to be able to then assist one another, especially those who are less fortunate.